Do you really need a hardware wallet to store your crypto? The short answer is no, but it is recommended. It really comes down to how much you have invested. If it's a small amount, you probably won't be too concerned leaving it on an exchange. But as that amount grows, you're likely going to start paying more attention. I'm Steve. I'm Kian. And this is The Learnings Report, a show where we make investing accessible and understandable for everyone. In today's video, we're going to be running through one of the OG crypto wallets, the Trezor Model 1. One of the best value for money wallets on the market, it's perfect for those looking to take the next step in securing their crypto. The thing, however, about keeping your funds on an exchange like Binance or Coinbase is that you technically don't have full control over the funds. The exchange holds the crypto on your behalf. And this means that you're prone to any risks that the exchange is prone to, and this can include hacks or disappearing entirely. Make sure to check out Netflix's recent documentary called Trust No One, which tells the story of how Canada's largest exchange, or one of them, disappeared overnight with the exchange's founder. We're going to run through the pros and cons of the Trezor wallet, how it compares to other models, how to set up your Trezor One, and how you use it with platforms such as Binance, Metamask, etc. If you're in a rush, you can use the timestamps to jump to a particular section that you're looking for, or stick around for a full overview. Lastly, if you haven't purchased a Trezor just yet and are considering to do so after watching the video, please feel free to use our referral link in the description. Sadly, we don't have a discount to offer you guys just yet, but if we get one, we'll make sure to update the description. But hey, it doesn't cost you anything anyway, so it'll also cover a pint between me and Kino. Okay, let's get it. For transparency, I've been in crypto since about 2018, and for the majority of that time, I've kept pretty much all my funds on the Binance exchange, and I'd imagine most of you do something similar. When it comes to storing your crypto safely, you can look at it in three tiers. Tier one is keeping your crypto on the exchange itself. You log into Binance or Coinbase, you navigate to your spot wallet, and there's all your crypto. When you hold your funds on a crypto exchange such as Binance or Coinbase, the exchange themselves basically hold custody of your private keys on your behalf. And the private key is essentially what ties the crypto that you own to you. This from a security standpoint is probably the riskiest of the three tiers because if Binance decided to close its doors tomorrow or do a runner entirely, you would have no way of accessing your funds. Therefore, from a security standpoint, it's generally recommended to create at least a hot wallet. And this brings us to tier two. But what is a hot wallet? A hot wallet is a form of digital storage that you can access via your phone or your computer, and it's connected to the internet. Basically, it's a software wallet. Metamask, Exodus, and Coinbase Wallet are all examples of hot wallets, and they're all free to use. With hot wallets, you have control over your private keys, so you don't need to rely on a third party to hold custody over them. Because they're still connected to the internet, they tend to be more vulnerable to hacks than cold storage wallets, and thus, there's still a risk. And this brings us to the third tier, cold storage or hardware wallets. Cold storage is the safest way to store your crypto. Your private keys are held offline away from the prying eyes of hackers. The main benefit is that cold wallets are capable of signing transactions without needing to connect to the internet. The great thing about a hardware wallet is even if you lose the device itself, your funds generally are still safe because your funds aren't stored on the device, they're just stored in the blockchain and the device gives you access to the blockchain. That being said, no crypto storage is completely invincible. Even with cold storage, there are still risks. For example, someone could gain access to your recovery seed phrase, which is what you need to access your hardware wallet, and they can drain your wallet that way. But comparatively speaking, holding your funds on a cold wallet is far superior than keeping it on an exchange. Trezor is the cold wallet that we're gonna be reviewing today, but do note that regardless of what cold storage you end up buying, do make sure to buy it from the manufacturer directly because if you buy it from a third party, such as off Amazon, there is a risk that it has been already compromised before you even get the wallet. So, what are the pros and cons of the Trezor wallet? Well, firstly, price is the big one. At the time of recording, the Trezor One wallet retails for approximately 73 euro. In terms of value for money, this is probably the biggest attraction. Another big pro is the number of supported tokens. Trezor supports over 1,800 coins and tokens. You can scroll through the full list of supported tokens by visiting trezor.io forward slash coins and we'll leave a link to that in the description below. It doesn't have everything, but it has most. They also offer their own hot wallet through Trezor Suite and this is available both on desktop and through a web application. Alternatively, Trezor also has a full integration with another free hot wallet called Exodus, which we'd recommend checking out. If you're a MetaMask user, and you probably are watching this video, the great news is that MetaMask supports a Trezor integration, which is really useful. In addition to the standard backup seed phrase, Trezor also offer an extra layer of optional security with their passphrase functionality. This is basically an extra word of your choosing to add to the end of your seed phrase that is needed to access your wallet. 
The idea is that even if someone knows or finds your seed phrase, unless they know your additional passphrase, they won't be able to access your wallet. As it's only one word, you likely would never even need to write the word down. You could just remember it. But of course, if you forget it, you're dust. But what about the cons? There aren't many, but there are a couple worth mentioning. Although Trezor supports a ton of coins and tokens, there are a couple that are unsupported. The Trezor One, at time of recording, does not support Monero, Ripple, EOS, or Cardano. It is worth noting, however, that the more expensive Trezor Model T does. So if you're holding bags in any of these tokens, you are gonna have to keep them in either hot storage or on another cold wallet. Another con is the lack of staking support. Some hardware wallets, such as Ledger, allow you to stake a number of coins directly from your hardware wallet. However, Trezor currently doesn't offer this functionality. A minor point, but in my opinion, I do think the hardware itself does feel a little bit cheap and flimsy, but that being said, it is one of the cheaper devices. And for any MacBook users, it is worth noting that we did have to try a couple of different USB cables and hubs to connect it to our MacBook. And of course, there's always the risk of hacks. Recently, Trezor was a victim of a phishing attack via compromised MailChimp account. Users received emails asking them to re-download Trezor Suite, where hackers had created a realistic duplicate of the software. Once users downloaded it and reconnected their Trezor, their accounts were wiped. Personally, I wouldn't be too dissuaded by this. Trezor themselves weren't technically hacked, so although users do need to be vigilant about phishing attacks, I don't think it's a massive con. Okay, let's do a quick comparison to your alternative options to the Trezor one. There are plenty of options, but let's just keep it simple and look at the Trezor one versus the Trezor Model T, and then the Trezor One versus the Ledger Nano S. When it comes to the Model One versus the Model T, spoiler alert, we probably suggest just sticking with the Model One, but here's a comparison nonetheless. The biggest differentiator is of course the price. The Trezor One costs 73 euro, while the Model T costs 232 euro. So what does the extra 159 get you? Well, the main additional features that you get are additional token support for the tokens we mentioned earlier, a full color touchscreen, and then your security protection, such as PIN, passphrase, etc., can be inputted directly onto the device itself instead of needing the help of your computer. So does the Model T sound three times better than the Model 1? We don't think so. Alternatively, you could look at getting the competitor, the Ledger Nano S. Ledger and Trezor are often compared to find out which one is better. We don't have a Ledger, so frankly, we can't really say that. But from all the research we've done, spoiler alert again, they're pretty much the same. Compared to the Trezor 1, the Ledger Nano S has a different design, is a tad bit cheaper at 59 euro. It has a mobile app. It offers pretty similar token support and it offers staking for certain tokens directly through the device. The great thing about the Trezor One wallet is that it's really easy to set up. And now we're gonna give you a quick walkthrough of how to do just that. So once you've connected up your Trezor wallet to your laptop, you're gonna first visit trezor.io forward slash start and download the Trezor suite. Once downloaded, you're gonna go through the process. For the first time you use your Trezor suite, you'll likely need to install new firmware. This shouldn't take too long, so just sit tight. You'll then be asked to disconnect and reconnect your Trezor device. And the device itself will display this. On this screen, we're gonna hit create a new wallet and then select standard seed backup. Confirm on your Trezor device. Next, you're gonna to wanna to create your backup. And this is a very important stage. To highlight the importance of these steps, Trezor does ask you to check these boxes, so do make sure you've read them carefully. The main points of note are one, don't take a photo or make a digital copy of your backup seed phrase. And of course, try to avoid telling anyone what your backup seed phrase is. On your device, you'll be given a list of 24 words that you need to write down on the hard piece of paper that arrived in your Trezor box. Once you've taken note of your backup seed phrase, you can then continue to create a pin. So to set your pin, you're gonna to need to use both your computer and the device itself. Your computer will look exactly as it is on screen here with just white dots. Your device will display a keypad and the numbers on screen correspond to the placement of the white dots that you'll see on your computer screen. So for the example, I'm just gonna do one, two, three, four. Your device will then reshuffle the placement of the numbers and you'll be asked to re-enter the same pin code. And we're pretty much there now. On this screen, you're gonna be asked to activate the coins that you want available on your device. You can change these at any time using the settings. Bitcoin will automatically be selected, but for now, I'm just gonna also activate Ethereum. By selecting Ethereum, you also will have access, as indicated, to all ERC20 tokens. Some examples are grayed out because as mentioned earlier, coins like XRP or Cardano are unfortunately not supported and are only supported by the Trezor Model T. If you choose, you can also activate testnet coins should you need them. Trezor also does offer an integration with the Tor browser, but we won't be going into that in this video. 
And that's it, you can add a name, change the home screen icon and access your Trezor suite. On this screen, you can choose to start with the standard wallet, which comes without a passphrase, or a hidden wallet, where a passphrase is required. As we explained earlier, having that passphrase just adds an extra level of security to your account, but you can edit this in your settings later on, should you want to. For now, we're just gonna stick with the standard wallet. Now that our Trezor wallet is set up, the next step in the process is to take some funds from an exchange like Binance and Coinbase and move them to your Trezor wallet. The process is pretty straightforward, and we're gonna show you an example using Binance now. But before we do, a quick reminder that if you transfer funds from an exchange to a wallet, this will entail a blockchain transaction and thus a fee. Similarly, when you move your funds from the wallet back to the exchange, this will also entail a fee. Each blockchain, of course, has different fees. So depending on the token that you're transferring, these fees will fluctuate, so do keep that in mind. So, a couple of quick ways to reduce your fees. If you plan to be a long-term holder and you don't plan on transacting that often, you can simply move your crypto from an exchange to your wallet in bulk and avoid the constant transaction fees that you'd accumulate from moving back and forth. Some wallets will also allow you to adjust the transfer speed of your transactions. Generally, you can choose between slow, medium, and fast. The slower the transaction time, the cheaper the transfer, the faster the transaction time, the more expensive the transfer is gonna cost. If this option is available to you, be wary when setting the fee too low, because sometimes that will mean that the transaction will never actually complete. And of course, if in any doubt, just leave it as the default setting, which is usually just normal. Thirdly, like any network, there are times when it's very congested and there's a lot of traffic, and then there are times when it's quieter. Generally, in the crypto space, it's usually recommended to make transfers early mornings or on weekends when the congestion is usually lower. The less people using the network, the cheaper your transactions are gonna be. And this is especially important when dealing with ERC20 tokens on the Ethereum network, because of course, we all know about the very high gas fees. Think of Uber surge pricing after a big event. More people are looking for rides at the same time, which equals higher fees. Okay, back to the example and moving your funds from Binance to your Trezor wallet. So log into your Binance account, go to wallet, feed and spot. So in this scenario, I'm just gonna withdraw some Bitcoin to my Trezor wallet. Once you have this screen open, you're gonna jump back into your Trezor wallet to grab a few details. The first thing you're gonna to want to do is click receive. To view your address, you're gonna to have to enter in your pin. So jump over to your Trezor device and grab the pin from there. On screen, you'll then see your Bitcoin receiving address. You can either use the QR code, but in this case, I'm just gonna copy the address directly. Once you've copied the address, you're gonna come back to your Binance account. Paste your Bitcoin address into the address bar and the network should automatically read that it is a Bitcoin address. For the sake of the example, I'm just gonna withdraw the minimum amount that's required, which is 0 0.001 worth of Bitcoin. And do remember that there is a Bitcoin fee that you will need to pay as well. When converted, the minimum amount you can withdraw from Binance at the time of recording is 44 US dollars worth. And the Bitcoin fee itself is half of that, which is again about $22. Obviously paying $20 for a $40 withdrawal doesn't really make much sense. We're only doing it for the example. So the idea of course, is that when you're doing it yourself, you should withdraw larger amounts in one go and thus get a better return on the fee itself. Once you're happy, simply click withdraw. So before you submit your transaction, it is again really important to triple check that the address that you're withdrawing to that you got from Trezor matches the exact address that you've typed in here on Binance. At the very least, double check that the first four digits and the last four digits match what's on your address on Trezor. Hit continue, complete your authentication process, and depending on the network congestion, and it might take just a couple of minutes, your Bitcoin should end up in your wallet without any trouble. Even when the Trezor wallet has registered that your Bitcoin is received, you will notice that it says pending transaction just for a little while while the actual transaction settles on the Trezor side of things. But once you see it here, you're confident that you're good to go. The process for ERC20 tokens or just Ethereum by itself is pretty similar. The only difference is that you'll have to manually add any ERC20 tokens yourself. To do that, just hit tokens, add token, and then you're gonna to need to go and find the ERC20 token address that you wish to add. The easiest way to do that is to go to etherscan.io and then use the search bar to find the token that you wish to add. For this example, we're just gonna use the guaranteed entrance token. And to get that, we're just gonna copy this contract address here, come back to our Trezor wallet and paste the token address in. One important thing to reiterate is that if you are withdrawing an Ethereum-based ERC20 token, you need to make sure that you select the Ethereum network and not the Bitcoin network. So if we take a look at Binance, when you hit withdraw and then you add your Ethereum address, 
into the address bar. It's really important to make sure that you select Ethereum from the dropdown and not BNB, BSC, Arbitrum, none of those. Just select Ethereum. If you accidentally select a network that's not Ethereum, you're more than likely gonna lose your funds, so it's really important to triple check this. As mentioned at the top of the video, Trezor also offers a simple integration with the MetaMask hot wallet, and it's quite easy to set up. We're gonna show you how to do that now. For the sake of the example, we're gonna assume that you already have MetaMask downloaded. Log in, you're then gonna to switch to the Ethereum mainnet. You're gonna hit your profile icon, connect hardware wallet. You'll see a few options here, and you're gonna hit Trezor. You're gonna make sure that your Trezor wallet is already plugged in, and click continue. You're then gonna hit allow once for this session, or should you want to, you can add it for always. You're then gonna click export. If this is your first time logging in, you won't actually have a passphrase necessarily, so you can just leave a blank to access your default wallet. You'll be given a list of accounts to choose from. You can choose whichever one you want. I'm gonna just choose number one and click unlock. You'll then see that the name has changed to Trezor One. This just means that your Trezor now is connected to MetaMask. Any funds that you send to this Trezor One address will only be visible on MetaMask once your Trezor wallet is connected. Cold wallets are definitely the most secure way of storing your cryptos. Hopefully in this video, we've given you a good overview of the Trezor One and why we think it's one of the best value wallets on the market. If you have any questions at all, please let us know in the comments below. And otherwise, we'll see you in the next one. What kind of businesses are you looking for?